Hello, everyone. Uh, today, I'm going to jump off my favorite thing to talk about, which is mindfulness and habit changes, and speak to something that I was actually interviewed about today. So I'm hosting a hypertension summit, how to reverse hypertension naturally. It'll go live in March. So I'm interviewing all these amazing uh, people. And one of them is Dr. Clapper. So I spoke to him all about salts and different things um, and how the blood, the body takes in sodium and increases your blood pressure. Then I was interviewed for a sleep summit and was discussing how valuable a whole food plant-based diet is in embracing lifestyle interventions. <clears throat> and one of the questions that was really interesting that got me thinking that I think might this might be helpful for you is understanding this bi-directional relationship between high blood pressure and sleep. And many times we think that <clears throat> high blood pressure doesn't wouldn't necessarily do anything to sleep, but it actually does. You know, high blood pressure is very insidious. I mean, it kind of sneaks up on you, right? You don't even realize you have it until someone measures it. Unless you have an acute elevation of your blood pressure, you might get headaches or dizziness, uh, blurred vision. <clears throat> so we can talk about what causes high blood pressure and stuff later, but I wanted to just speak to just kind of the complex relationship about between sleep and high blood pressure. So first, how high blood pressure affects sleep, right? So first of all, there's sleep disorders. So high blood pressure is associated with an increased risk of sleep disorders, particularly uh, sleep apnea. Basically, sleep apnea is, is repeated interruptions of breathing during sleep, which can lead to that fragmented, non-restorative sleep and daytime fatigue. So now was the sleep apnea causing the hypertension or vice versa? The sleep doctor that interviewed me says, actually, it can be the other direction as well. So I don't know if that disturbs the sleep centers in the brain, um, but I did find it really interesting uh, to learn that. There's also some uh, nocturnal symptoms, right? So hypertension can lead to disruption of sleep, like what we call nocturia or nighttime urinating. And so if you find that you're getting up in the middle of the night to frequently go to the bathroom, maybe you should check your blood pressure as well. That might be something to uh, look into. Um, it can also, of course, cause some headaches, some other things as well. But just note, if something is unusual, just check your blood pressure, speak to your doctor about it. And then the other thing is anxiety and stress, right? So, you know, dealing with the diagnosis of hypertension can be very stressful for many people, especially if it's not being well-maintained or if they have a family history of high blood pressure and they witnessed what uncontrolled blood pressure can do to maybe a loved one or a colleague or a friend. So that can lead to difficulty falling asleep um, or staying asleep. So we let our brain go wild with many things that we tend to worry about that would probably never happen. And that's kind of the rabbit hole that we lead us down. And then how does sleep affect high blood pressure? I think this one makes a little bit more sense and that you can follow the A to B pattern. Um, blood pressure regulation. So sleep plays a critical role in various bodily functions, like including the blood pressure. So during normal healthy sleep, blood pressure actually naturally dips. Um, it's called nocturnal dipping. I didn't come up with the word, you know, and so disrupted or inadequate sleep can interfere with this process, leading to less pronounced dips or even nighttime high blood pressure. So if you're not getting the sleep depth, you know, entering into REM sleep or deep sleep, you're not going to get that natural decrease in your blood pressure. So again, if you're finding yourself frequently waking at night, check your blood pressure. It might be worth noting. Stress hormone levels, right? So poor sleep quality or insufficient sleep can increase the body's production of stress, um, can increase the body's production of stress hormones like cortisol, for example. And that alone in and of itself can raise high blood pressure or blood pressure levels. Um, and if you do chronic sleep deprivation where you're not getting restful, re restorative sleep on a regular basis, um, you can have an overall sympathetic nervous system activation, right? So the sympathetic nervous system is related to the fight or flight, meaning you get revved up, you're not, you're no longer hungry, you're like 
ready to go or fight or do something to get out of this stressful situation. So if you have a chronically activated sympathetic nervous system, you can also um, contribute to increased blood pressure. The other thing is, of course, lifestyle impact, right? So chronic uh, poor sleep can affect lifestyle choices. You're not feeling well. Your mood is not so good. Um, and that can reduce uh, your ability to exercise or motivation to exercise. It makes it harder to make healthy you know, food choices. Um, and all of those, of course, increase your risk for hypertension. Um, also inflammation, right? So I think many of us understand that inflammation is really at the root of many chronic diseases, including uh, cardiovascular disease. And so this is where I'm kind of headed here is inflammation of endothelial cells or the, that lining or the function. So, you know, poor sleep can lead to increased inflammation and impaired endothelial function, um, which is the inner cell lining. If you ever watched a Dr. Esselstyn video, he's much more elegant at describing this for than for me, but this single cell layer, and it's important because it releases nitric oxide. Again, nitric oxide is a fascinating journey on and of itself, but it causes the blood vessels to dilate. And so if you have decreased endothelial function, we have arterial stiffening, which leads to elevated blood pressure. Um, and just one more thing I wanted to mention, this is a little bit outside of sleep and the bidirectional relationship with high blood pressure. Uh, I wanted to mention something that I've seen several patients do that have difficulty with high blood pressure and sleep, and that is consuming alcohol. So sometimes people think, oh, I'm just going to have my wine uh, or my beer or, you know, one or two drinks a night and I'll be fine. This actually disrupts your sleep and alcohol in and of itself can actually increase blood pressure as well. So if you're struggling to figure out why you're not getting restful sleep and your blood pressure remains elevated, maybe it's as simple as removing the alcohol that you might be consuming. And especially if you're noticing that it's occurring only on the evenings or maybe the night that you consume alcohol and a few days later, because it can take some time uh, to see that sleep regulation improve. So just some thoughts for you there. So understand that, you know, the sleep and blood pressure are bidirectional, um, meaning that hypertension can worsen sleep quality and poor sleep can exacerbate high blood pressure. And this just turns into a vicious cycle, right? How do you stop one? Well, the first thing we do is uh, really think about things that we can do to improve our sleep, control our blood pressure with medications if necessary, and embrace those lifestyle choices that will help lower your blood pressure, like eating the dark green leafy vegetables that are full of nitrates, uh, your beets, your beet greens, arugula, a chard, again, collard greens. Dr. Esselstyn has a lovely, lovely way of almost sing song, all of his greens. I will be interviewing him. Actually, I believe it's on Friday and Jane and Anne, um, all for the hypertension summit. So definitely something to look out for. And um, at the end of the day, remember, it's just important to also take the medication if you need to, because blood pressure is literally the number one cause of death around the world. Um, so many people don't understand that they have it and it can cause insurmountable damage to your kidneys, to your heart, causes heart failure, stroke, things like that. So get a blood pressure cuff. You can get Omron is a really simple one. Um, I think I have one here somewhere. I like to keep one available to show patients when I am seeing them. Here we go. And um, this one I think was like, I don't know, $34, $32 on Amazon. It's the Omron H-E-M- RML 31. I don't know if that's what you need, but it looks like this. And what you want to do is put the cuff on your upper arm. You want to utilize one that uses the upper arm, not a wrist, because these are more accurate. And if you have concerns about the accuracy, you can always go to your doctor and have them listen with their ears to make sure that this is calibrated correctly. Um, you want to be... <laughs> sitting for five minutes, um, not speaking, not drinking, not eating, having had your last meal about half an hour at least. And then check, you can check it on the same arm, you can go to different arms, but 
wait a minute or two and try to do maybe two or three pressure readings, deep breathing, relax, and then you can average those out. And that'll give you a really good uh, understanding of where your blood pressure is at that moment in time. Now you can also make sure that you're checking your blood pressure regular at the same times of days because there is a circadian rhythm to blood pressure. And you may wanna make sure that you're actually measuring it at the same time. I also like to have patients measure at different times because at different times of the day, you may be higher and we need to be make note of that and then do active interventions to make sure that it improves. Um, what are the blood pressures I'm looking for? I'm looking for blood pressures to remain under 120 and under 80. That is ideal, maybe even 115 and lower uh, on top because that is the systolic pressure. That's when the heart is contracting and it's exerting blood pressure um, against the arteries during, as the heart is squeezing. And then between uh, contractions, there's a rest period where the heart is filling back up before it contracts again. That is the point in time that that resting um, stiffness or pressure uh, can be measured. <clears throat> it's called diastolic, and that is your lower um, blood pressure number. So when do I determine that patients need to stop medications or decrease medications? A few. Um, when I give them three things, actually. So the first thing is numbers. Um, data is really easy. If you're checking your blood pressure regularly, I need you checking it before medications and then at least an hour after medications. And the reason I do that is to look for the baseline blood pressure. And because if it's, let's say, 130 over, I don't know, 85, and you're on three blood pressure medications, mm, might not be a good idea to take all three because that might bottom you out, meaning with too low of blood pressure and can cause all sorts of issues in and of itself. So if that occurs, you know, let your doctor know, say, hey, I'm pretty getting decent blood pressures. Do I need to stop any of these medications? And the other thing is if you're symptomatic, right? So if you are dumb, dizzy upon standing um, and you're just like, whoa, didn't lightheaded that feeling. We've all kind of had it maybe when we were sick or something that could be a problem with the blood pressure being too low because of the medication. Remember, when you stand or when we move or even sit up, blood pressure will naturally increase. That's a normal, good function because we gotta get that blood to the brain. And so that is one thing that you wanna to consider. The other one is if you notice that you had great energy and suddenly you're like, man, I'm just really tired. I just wanna take a nap. That can be an indication that your blood pressure is too low. Make sure you're checking your blood pressure. And that goes back to, circles back to making sure you check the blood pressure an hour or so after taking medications so we can see just what the blood pressure medication is doing to you. It does not mean to go and eat salty foods and increase it back up. That's not what that means. It means that we need to decrease medications. Those are the typical indications for blood pressure. That's, I hope that makes sense. So Remember, there are three major components that I really encourage patients to focus on because um, I think, you know, us all trying to have the goal of being lifestyle perfect, there is no such thing. We all struggle, um, but there are three things that if you can hone in on these three things, so many of the other things get easier. A healthy anti-inflammatory diet, plant-predominant diet, beans, veggies, uh, fruits, and whole grains, and some nuts and seeds. Two, restorative sleep, going to bed at the same time, waking up at the same time, making sure the room is dark, making sure it's quiet, earplugs, mask, whatever you need to do to make it your little cubby hole so you can go in and feel like you're nice and snug and to sleep. Uh, make sure the room is nice and cool, 68 degrees or so, works nicely, and um, adjusting from there. If you find that you're urinating frequently at night, decreasing the amount of fluids that you're drinking at least three to four hours prior to bedtime, the rate of which you're drinking fluid also makes sense. So maybe just sip instead of gulp. Decreasing stress before bed, decreasing the light, the melatonin is very sensitive to light. So again, the bright lights, um, again, those are just the ones I'm running off the top of my head for the sleep. So you want healthy plant-based diet, better restore to sleep, and move your body. Move your body. Motion is lotion for the body. So the more you move, guess what? You get better sleep. And I found that 
around 12,000 steps seems to be my threshold, that the more I get beyond that, I'm still good. But if I don't get my quite to my 12,000, I don't sleep as well. So maybe there's something there, a diary on your sleep or those three things might be a, a good thing to think back on and look at for the future. And yeah, I think that's everything today. I hope that was helpful. And um, yeah, so fascinating stuff. Um, tomorrow, I'm going back to <laughs> my favorite just topic. I um, am in the middle of listening to a book called Mindfulness. And I just finished another book by the same author, The Mindful Body by Dr. Ellen Langer. She works at Harvard and she agreed this morning to let me interview her. So I get really tickled and excited. I'm just so honored that someone will take the time to let me speak to them. And I can't wait for you also to hear this awesome interview because I know it's going to be phenomenal. I've been digesting everything that I can get my hands on since I first heard a podcast that she was on. Um, yeah, so I'll jump on the mindful bag wagon tomorrow. I was really excited. I actually woke up in the middle of the night with this awesome, fun thought I wanted to share with you today, but I replaced it with hypertension because I felt maybe someone needed to hear it today. So hope that's helpful. And um, if you're in the Healing Kitchen, and if you're not, you can check it out, the Healing Kitchens at drmarvis.com. It is a membership that we have with uh, Brittany Giroudi. She provides recipes. We meet weekly. And tonight we meet every Wednesday. She cooks. I get to sit and just drool. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I have time to, to cook with her. Um, and then I answer medical questions. And then we have two expert workshops monthly. Uh, this Saturday is going to be Dr. Michael Clapper. So if you want to, you can just purchase the workshop too if you want, or you can join the Healing Kitchen and come. And because it's free to all Healing, Healing Kitchen members, um, he's going to be speaking about hypertension. And then on the 30th, I also do a monthly workshop with an ebook every month. And um, I'll be speaking about osteoporosis. So, and I answer questions and I'll do those every month. <clears throat> I am also open, opening up my next glucose mastermind. We don't have the landing page up quite yet. You can still sign up for the waiting list if you like. We'll be starting the first group December 12th um, and we'll meet December 19th and 12th um, in December. And then in January, we'll meet twice. And in February, we'll meet twice. So be on the lookout for that. Cause I know many of you have emailed me asking, I'm only going to be taking a certain number of people because I really want it to be a, the group dynamic to where we can discuss and share and get you the CGM and look at your data. So I anyway, hope that's all helpful and fun and cool. You guys have a rest, wonderful rest of your evening. I know I am. I can't wait to go and spend some time with folks in the healing kitchen. So have a great day and I will see you tomorrow. Okay. Bye everyone.